Are you a warrior? Maybe you're easily stressed. Are you quickly negative? What about kind of pessimistic? Are you somewhat of a doomsdayer? Well, guess what? You don't have to be. Fear doesn't have to win all the time. Face it with us. Let's learn how to deal with it all. Living fearless. I'm going to get started tonight with Luke 5, and I want to talk uh, briefly tonight about the story of the paralytic man. The story of the paralytic man. So if you're there at Luke 5, say amen, amen, and we'll get started. Beginning with verse 16, I'm reading in the New King James. You can read along in whatever version you have. But in beginning in verse 16, it says, So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Verse 18, then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. When they could not find out how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up to the housetop and they let him down on his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. Verse 20, and when he saw their faith, everybody say their faith, their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven. Man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But God alone. Amen. And so today I want to teach just for a few minutes on a sermon titled, Can I Just Go Home? Can I Just Go Home? Look to your neighbor and say, Sometimes I just want to go home. Sometimes I just want to go home. It was Halloween 2012, if I remember dates well, and that's questionable at, at its best. I stood around a ticket counter in Birmingham, Alabama at the International Airport, and there were 12 other people whose eyes were fixed wholly on me. The stewardess had just announced that the plane that we were about to board was beginning to have mechanical difficulties. Everybody say, uh-oh. Uh-oh, something you really never want to hear is the plane you're about to board is having a few difficulties. This was the first group that I had ever led overseas. A friend of mine and a fellow pastor, I I'm going to throw him under the bus and say that he had totally talked me into this. He decided he would take 27 people with him, and I would take 13. We would book this trip together, and because of the large number, we would get this magical discount that would be there, and we would all be able to have this glorious time in Italy for 14 days at this hugely discounted price. But first, we had to get there. No problem, he said. This is the easiest thing you've ever done. It'll be fun is the last thing I remember as he hung up the phone. Our group was scheduled to depart the airport first. We, we had arrived early like you're supposed to do. We had checked our luggage in plenty of time. We had went through TSA and been patted down and violated and twist and turned and everything you can imagine. We were ready to go. When we finally got that news, then all we could do was wait. I don't think that I really got too worried about this until I saw his group arrive, and me knowing that it was supposed to leave two hours after mine, the big uh-oh went through my head. I watched them walk calmly down to their gate, and I can swear Although Ed will argue, I saw Ed hold up his boarding pass and ticket with a little grin as he walked by. His plane was both on time and apparently able to fly. I begged and I pleaded with the stewardess, change our flight. 
Change our flight. You don't understand. You, we, we've got things we've got to do. We've got to schedule. We've got to keep. But it just wasn't possible with a group this size. The real frustration came when I looked down at the itinerary and I reviewed the schedule and realized if we miss our connecting flight in Detroit, then we're going to miss our tour buses in Venice. And if we miss our tour buses in Venice, our trip is canceled. As time came and went, all the planes did the same thing. And then there was that moment of realization, that point where, where you're staring at your schedule and looking at that magical board above the ticket counter and you realize you just have one more chance to get on the plane. There's one more opportunity to reach your destination. I had made the plans correctly. I had spent time preparing, so I thought. I had even paid for a ticket, but something wasn't working right, something I had missed. Maybe, maybe I could bribe someone if I knew who to grease their palm with, and maybe there was something I could say to someone that would get our group on through. Maybe there's somebody I could talk to and plead my case, but it wasn't there. And at this point, there was only one question left. There was only one question that remained in my head, and that is how do I get our group that last set of seats on that last plane out? How do we get a seat on the last flight out of here? And so as I'm recounting the story and I, I, I'm writing some of this stuff, it, it, it hit me. That's really the question in life, right? How do we get a seat on that plane that's on its way out? That's the real question, and it's probably not about vacationing. It's probably not about your tour. It's about life. We make plans. We think we're prepared. But when it comes to the end, is the only hope we have is that we may close our eyes and wake up somewhere else. Nothing is quite as scary as this. Nothing can cause quite as much fear as being unsure about your last flight home. Not from Birmingham to Venice, the last flight in our life, that flight from earth up to heaven. To be left behind as that last plane pulls away, could there be any more fearful thought than that? We have tons of fears, you know? We, we have multitudes of phobias. We have book after book written on them. We have fears of heights and fears of people, fears of commitment, fears of clowns, which is probably my personal favorite. But what fear can personally compare to the fear of the insecurity about the next life? Here's a question I want you to remember and tuck it away in the back of your head. How can you have peace in this life if you're unsure about the next. How can you have peace in this life if you're unsure about the next? Of all the fears that we're going to cover in this series, shouldn't this be the first one we hit on? Shouldn't this really rank on the top of the list? I believe that Jesus believed that. I believe that when Jesus weighed all the fears of what's going on, the number one concern he had is about how you're going to leave this world and where you're going to go. Matthew records this same story that we had just read with just a couple of edits. In, in Matthew's version, in, 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 verse, in, in chapter 9, verse 2, he reminds the paralytic, listen, take courage. Don't fear. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are real. Notice how he is marrying together courage with forgiveness. Courage with forgiveness. Now, Jesus is saying to this man who cannot move, he, he's a disabled man, he's lying on a bed, he couldn't walk, he couldn't run, he was stuck, but he did have four friends. He did have four friends, and those friends knew one thing, they knew one thing, a moment with Christ 
can change one's circumstance. Just a moment, just a moment with Christ can change everything. Picture this, they, they, they grab the map, probably the one that he was sitting on in the street. And one with each corner, I, I believe that they took him to the house, as the word says, where Jesus was teaching. Picture the place packed out. It's filled with people everywhere. Doorways are full. People have, have opened the shutters and have their head stuck through the windows trying to get an ear full it's almost like they actually believe that God himself was going to be in the house. I always picture these as young guys. I, I sort of have to believe that for this scheme that they've come up with. Knowing that they couldn't get Jesus by going through the door, one of them, or maybe more, had the bright idea of we'll go up and over. So picture this, you have four teenagers, you saw our kids come up just a few minutes ago, picture four of our kids deciding that they are going to take a man on top of a roof. It's a thought, right? A couple of them climb up the side of the wall and reach down and tell a couple of other ones, all right, now pass him up. Maybe you've not thought about what it must have looked like for him to get up there. But I'm guessing with those four kids and the man, I'm picturing something like the Three Stooges and the laughter of it all. It's crazy. They pull, they pull, the others push and they push, and finally, whew, he's up there. Perhaps his arms are a little longer from being stretched and pulled and he's scuffed up, but he made it. He's up there. And I'm just guessing, but most homeowners that I know really don't take too kindly to having the roofs disassembled. I'm guess guessing that they are whispering and wedging and pulling as they try to pull the roof off. And I'm guessing that most paralytics don't look forward to a bungee jump that's going through a roof, just a guess. But they shoved him through the hole anyway. And I'm pretty sure that most teachers don't like to be interrupted by some insane panic of a bunch of teenagers. And they probably looked at him like, my word, you are trying to get attention. And while we might not know what the homeowner said or what the expression was on his face as his roof was torn off, or we might not can hear what the paralytic might have screamed on his way down, I'm picturing something like a Disney cartoon, I think Matthew does a great job of painting a perfect picture of what the expression must have been on Jesus' face. Because I believe Jesus' face was a smile as they set him down and said, take courage, your sins are forgiven. Jesus wasn't upset at all that he was interrupted. He really wasn't. He was excited. So excited, so excited that as you read the story, what amazed me is that he actually gives a blessing to the man that is never asked for when he forgives his sins. And in fact, it's not really even expected. The story at least infers that he had come for healing, not forgiveness. And yet what Jesus thought the most important piece was it's the forgiveness. As I'm reading the story, I'm really expecting it to be very different. Wouldn't you? I, I, there are a dozen options, I believe, that Jesus could have done. I mean, he's paralyzed. I think there's lots of things Jesus might have been more appropriate, at least in today's world. 
He, he could have told him that you're completely healed, now walk, and then you're forgiven. But Jesus doesn't do that. He waits to heal him physically until after he has healed him spiritually. He doesn't say a word about the physical situation. He instead skips over this acrobatics that has happened. He jumps over the dangling limbs and he dives right for this man's heart. And he says the statement, take courage. Your sins, they're forgiven. I believe that Jesus was thinking about the man's deepest problem at that point. And really, it's about our deepest problem, sin. I believe that he is addressing our deepest fear and our biggest barrier about this uncertainty of eternity. Before Jesus healed the man's body, he first decided to heal his soul. Before he healed the man's body, he first decided to heal his soul. In the gospel, Jesus actually issues over two dozen calls to take courage. Two dozen times, he says, stop fear, don't be afraid. But it's important to note, this is the very first one. The very first time Jesus says, take courage, and it's about forgiving of his sins. It's about making sure you're on the last flight home. We sometimes get so caught up in our circumstances that we forget about stuff, so bound up by our plans and our schedules. We know exactly what we want from Jesus. We want him to do A, B, and C, and the whole time Jesus is going, none of that matters to me right now. I want to make sure you can take the last flight home. Listen to this. He is more worried about the man's sin than about the man's sickness. Listen to this again. He is more worried about the man's sin than he is about the man's sickness. To sin is to disregard God. It's to lead a godless life. It's to say you don't need him. And sin sinners, its complete existence around self. Everything about sin is selfish, and it's about self. And it is probably best characterized by simply capitalizing this middle letter of the word sin. It's I. An honest scan of our lives will simply show that we are selfish people. You can say amen or oh me, but if you're really honest, we are a selfish bunch. And most of us hate that about ourselves. We can't stand our attitudes, at least I can't sometimes. I'm frustrated with my lack of patience. Maybe you are too. And we stare at ourselves in a mirror and know that some of us who are over 40 if taking a snapshot of our lives, realize that we act an awful, awful lot like we're under 10. One of the early prophets in the Old Testament wrote this about sin and about us. He said in Isaiah 53, 6, all of us like sheep, we have gone astray. We have left God's path to follow our own. God says, go left, and we go right. God says to forgive them, and we decide we're going to get even. God says to be generous, and we decide it's time to be stingy. God says to quit worrying, and guess what we do? We launch an all-night campaign on Facebook and the telephones and worry not only ourselves, but everybody else. We pay absolutely no attention to God, and we are just like those, those sheep so many times in our life. We've gone astray and we sin. Well, we finally got on the plane, and we headed out. 
we barely caught our connecting flight in Detroit. But we did, and we landed in Italy. And it was absolutely beautiful. But how many people have ever heard the expression that trouble comes in twos? It does. It pairs up. Don't know where, don't know who wrote it, but I wish they never had. Close, close friend of mine was in the group, Lisa. And late one evening, she got a call. We were in Rome, and her mother had been in a horrible car accident. Lisa was absolutely devastated, absolutely devastated. I watched her countenance change. I was standing next to her when she actually got the call, and I watched just, just you can see when somebody gets news like that, and it just falls. Her mom was in UAB Hospital there in Birmingham, and it didn't look too good. Lisa looked at me, and with just eyes, and anybody who knows, I am a soft-hearted when somebody starts crying. Tearing up, and she says, John, I want to go home. She had had a good time. Plans had been made, and she had executed most of them. We traveled across the countryside. But Lisa wanted to go home. Maybe you can relate to that. Sometimes you just want to go home. You want to go home to feel something familiar, to feel loved on, to feel wrapped around. Lisa and I sat down. We had a tour guide, and her name was Contessa, and we sat down with Contessa. And we just asked the question, just very, very easy, just asked that question, how do we get Lisa home? I know it's not on the schedule. I know it's not planned. How do we get Lisa home? Contessa shuffled her feet, and I remember her just absolutely just uh, amazed that we're even asking that question. And she looked at us, and she said, I know exactly what to do. I said, good. And so Lisa went to her room, and I went to my room, and, and, and we were expecting the call. And about 3 a.m., I get a call, and it's Lisa, and she's crying. Contessa had let her down. Contessa had said that the ticket offices were all closed, and it was the weekend and had no way to get her home. And because of the time schedule and the differences and a lot of stuff I didn't understand, we're probably not going to get her in home in time to see her mom. I believe that the Holy Spirit gave me a word at that moment. And for those of you who don't believe in that, I had a thought. And I just said this, Lisa, I need you not to worry, girl. I want you to go and pack your bags. You're going home. I hung up the phone and I picked up my iPad. And here I am just going on it, going on it. And instead of worrying about somewhere in this foreign land, I punched in Delta and Atlanta. Picked up my cell phone. And somehow, through the miracle of God himself, I didn't get a recording. I got a person. And it sounded like this. Hi, this is Jennifer. Can I help you? And I may not have recognized the voice on that phone, but I did recognize she was American. And better than that, I recognized she was Southern. And so I'm sure my draw might have kicked a couple of points. I began to tell Jennifer the story of what we've been through, and I could hear those familiar sounds of those typing keys. I'd heard it in earlier, and the other steward is trying to get us on planes, and it's just going as hard as she can, and I am swear it must have been smoke even coming through the phone. Then came the question, John, yes, Jennifer, does Lisa have a ticket? No. She doesn't. Jennifer, what do I need to do to get Lisa a ticket right now? And Jennifer said this. This will etch in my head forever. All you need to do is put her on the phone. 
I want you to picture me. I'm about 6'5", 200 and some odd pounds, bolting out of a room in a hotel in the middle of Rome, and here I go. I'm, not, I'm probably dressed in night clothes. Let's just leave it right there. We'll stay G. And I'm coming straight down the hall, and I'm banging on the door as hard as I can. Lisa, answer the phone. She opens the door, and I shove the phone right up to her ear. And the next few minutes are really just a blur. That's all there were to me. I can't tell you exactly how the conversation went in all honesty, but I can tell you how it ended. It ended when Lisa handed me the phone back and with tears in her eyes said, John, I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going home. You see, those tears of fear had been replaced with tears of joy. She was going home. I want to know what happened yet because the story is just too good to, to pass up. She got on the plane and she got home, but, but, but my favorite is really how it was handled. I grabbed the bags and here I am running down in the lobby of this hotel in the middle, middle of Rome and I'm shoving them into a taxi and, and I'm just handing them money. I don't, I don't know how the currency is and I'm, just, I'm hoping it's enough and hoping that, that it's not too much and I, I don't care at that point. And she pulled up to the curb of the airport. And a man opened her door and said, I bet you're Lisa. We've been expecting you. And he grabbed a hold of her bags and grabbed a hold of her. The bags went flying one way and she went flying another. He walked her straight through security in there. And they got up to the thing and everybody is there. And she said, the plane is waiting on you. Walked her down the little terminal aisle or whatever you call it and get her in the plane and gave her a first class seat and said, you don't worry about a thing. Everything has been handled. Everything has been handled. Everything is handled. What about you? Is everything handled in your life? Has everything worked out for your last ride home? Is everything, all the plans made? Do you have your ticket? Do you have your boarding pass? Maybe the question that you need to ask yourself tonight is do you have a ticket for the last flight home? Has everything been arranged? When the plane pulls out, are you going to be standing at the gate saying, I wished I had a way on? Or are you going to be on the plane heading home? You've been bound up by your sickness, some of you, and you've not worried about your sin. You've been bound up with your, your times and your problems and the person's and you've forgotten about Jesus. Do you have a flight? Do you have a seat? And are you on your way home? Here's what I can say to you. If you are unsure tonight on whether you will be on that last flight, can I tell you that there is a family sitting around you right now that will literally tear the roof off of this place just to get you to Jesus. Roger said this a long time ago. I will do everything short of sin to show you Jesus. Are you ready to go home? I don't know where you are in this journey. Maybe you're you're bound up. Maybe, maybe life for you has, has been a whirlwind of problems. Tonight's message is very simple. I told y'all last week, the greatest fear you can have in your life is not the problems you will have around you, but it's where you will spend eternity. And tonight you can settle that. 
tonight you can settle that. Let's stand up. Again, we are incredibly glad that you joined us here today at Church Online. We encourage you to go to the website. There you can find any of our archive podcasts. You can send us an email about how God's working in your life or prayer request. Or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Have a blessed day.